Let's make sure it's working before you. Yeah, it's recording. OK, so welcome. Uh, my name is Maureen Meredith. I work for the City of Austin Housing and Planning Department. I am going to be. Um, I am the case manager for this plan amendment case. The case is NPA 2019 0022.01. If you haven't done so already, please let us know who you are by using the chat box. You can see the symbol there. You could put type in your name and the organization if you are associated with one. Yeah. I'll use that as my sign in sheet. If you could please mute your microphone if you're joining by phone and also if you're on your computer, if you could also mute your microphone and also turn off your video that helps preserve the online bandwidth. So how to participate today. The speech bubble in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen will open the chat box where you can type in your questions at any time. After the presentations, you can click on the raise hand icon to be called on to speak. So as I mentioned, my name is Maureen Meredith. I am the case manager for the plan amendment case. And then we will introduce the other staff member, Mark Walters, and then Richard Weiss and Chris, and then we will go on to continue staff presentation. So Mark. Good evening. My name is Mark Walters. I'm a principal planner in the housing and planning department, and I'll be moderating tonight's questions. Did you get one, Liz? Hi, I'm uh, I'm Chris Wallen. I'm the um, owner of the property. Uh, thanks for all attending. I appreciate it. And Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Weiss, and I am an architect and uh, the applicant. Okay. So here is my contact information and also the contact information for Kate Clark. She is the zoning case manager. Um, if you want to, if you have paper and pen, if you want to jot down these phone numbers, you can do that now, or I can go back to the slide at the end of the meeting and you can write it down there. So our agenda today, I'll go over some basic case information, guidelines for group discussion, how to participate in the process, why there is a plan amendment application, what is a future land use map. Then we will have the app, uh, applicant presentation. In this case, we'll also have a presentation by the uh, neighborhood, and then we will go into questions and answers. So the property address is 200 Academy Drive. Case number is MPA 2020-0022.01. The request to the future land use map is to change it from mixed use office to mixed use land use. This is the zoning case number C14 2020-0147. The request is to change the zoning from commercial service one NCCD neighborhood plan and MF4 NCCD neighborhood plan to CS1 MU neighborhood plan and MF4 neighborhood plan for residential office and limited commercial use. The property owner applicant is Spearhead Academy and you met Chris Wallen and as you know the agent is Richard Weiss from Weiss Architecture. Some basic guidelines as you know because of COVID we are no longer able to meet in person so we have moved to this online format. Everyone will be allowed to speak. We ask that you listen respectfully and actively to criticize ideas, not individuals, commit to learning, not debating, avoid blame, speculation, inflammatory language, avoid assumptions about others, especially based on their perceived social group, and staff deserves the right to delete any offensive language and remove offenders from the meeting. We have not had any problems with these meetings so far, but we like to keep those guidelines in. Um, for group discussions, Please feel free to type your questions into, to, into the chat box at any time during this meeting. After the presentations, if you would like to speak, please raise your hand by clicking the hand symbol. Telephone participants will be able to speak during the Q&A session. We just ask that if, if there's a chance at which you want to speak, just get our attention. 
Attendees will be muted upon arrival and through the staff and applicant presentations. Then staff will open the floor to answer questions in the chat or by attendees, raise, attendees raising their hands to speak. Similar questions may be grouped together and answered together. We ask that you mute your microphones when you're not speaking for the sake of sound quality and clarity of conversation. If you're having connection issues, please turn off your video until con called on um, to ask your question. So if you have questions after this meeting, you can always call or email me or Kate. Uh, we will get you the answer and we will also post it to the website speakupaustin.org forward slash NPA. That Marie, is also the web. Yes. Uh, someone also asked if we could put the slides up for tonight's presentations. And I said we'll put them up on that website once we once we put everything up. They'll right. Be available as a PDF. Right. So this meeting will is is being recorded and we will post the meeting which will have all the slides um, at that uh, website. Um, you can email me or Kate with any questions that you have. If you wanted to provide written comments to be added to staff case reports, you can send it to me and Kate. If you live within 500 feet, when the case cases are scheduled for planning commission city council, you will receive that notice in the mail and the notice will have instructions on how to participate in the public hearings. So why do we have a plan amendment? Neighborhood plans are adopted by city council as amendments to the Imagine Austin comprehensive plan. The city charter requires zoning changes to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Most neighborhood plan amendments are changes to the future land use map and most plan amendment applications have an associated zoning application. This map shows the areas in blue that have city council approved neighborhood plans, most of which have a future land use map. So future land use maps look like this. These colors represent broad land uses. For example, the yellow represents a single family, pink office, brown is mixed use. We use this chart to show what zoning districts are typically found within uh, land use categories. I know with the NCCD it's different, but I believe Richard will go into a little bit more detail about that. This is an aerial photo of the property. And this map here is just from Google Maps that shows some of the surrounding uses. This is a future land use map. Uh, the colors are rather pale, but the orange represents multifamily. Um, there is a maroon color, which is the mixed use office, and there's a small part to the top that is brown, which is mixed use. This is the zoning map. You can see uh, what the zoning is with, on the property. We have CS NCCDNP, CS1 NCCDNP, and MF4 NCCDNP. This map shows the property in relation to the growth concept map for, with the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. You can see South Congress is an activity corridor and you see the South Central Waterfront, which is a activity center. So uh, we got a request from the neighborhood to do a pres brief presentation before Richard does his presentation. So I will exit out. And I can pull up their presentation. Or Laura, did you want to just share your screen? Um, Maureen, I think there's some confusion here. I'm not sure. Uh, we don't have a presentation until we've seen how this has been changed. Of course, it was submitted uh, the last time we met with the applicant was 2019. So, uh, uh, okay. I thought Paula said, Paula, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I, I sent you my presentation, but that's not what you have on there. there. And it's, it's just more about quotes from the neighborhood and, um, and the uh, Fairview Park petition. Yeah, I, oh, I, okay. I think we need to hear what the proposal is because we're really in the dark uh, at this point. So, um, OK, I thought y'all said you wanted to do a presentation. Um, and Paula said, I, Paul, I thought you said Laura was going to do the presentation tonight. So you want me to just. No, no, I said she's she's kind of organizing it, but but. Um, 
If you want to put it up, then um, I'll just show the petition. We just have to say something. I can't. I don't know how to say anything. Just okay, let me see if I can just. Line up line I, it comes in line. and out. Okay, I'm trying to find it. Now we've got some video, but I don't see any Maybe presentations. Yeah. And what she's looking for is a quote from the Fairview Park um, NCCD members of that NCCD. And um, we're talking about zoning changes, but what I was really looking at is the fact that there is an NCCD in place and all of the properties that are within that NCCD have other commitments that they made when they um, when they're in that property. And so in the petition, the petition said that a majority of the residents of the Fairview Park NCCD voted that they didn't want to remove any of the properties from the NCCD. So it's my understanding that the applicant was looking to remove the the commitments that they had made when they bought the property in the NCCD and how that would be changing some of what it is, is allowed to be built on those properties. And those changes are quite drastic. And so I wanted to show the voice of the neighbors in Fairview Park. And then I also had a quote from the South River City citizens there we go. There we go. So this is the petition. And so we can just go through, you know, I pretty much explained what I was going. And then this is from the South River City Citizens. Compatibility, talking about compatibility, we agree that we can increase height on the corridors, but this, this property is not on the corridors. And however, we believe we should retain compatibility standards within the neighborhoods. So I took some pictures of some, some of these areas right around that area and showing that this, this applicant's not allowing people to park on their parking lot, and that it's caused a lot of congestion in Academy. And so these are some of the concerns that the different neighbors had talked about. So some other concerns of the, the South Rip, it's um, flooding in the environment. We agree that the proposed zoning changes goal to address environmental concerns, such as, the decrease in impervious cover. But um, looking at these, these Atlas for floodplain definitions, some of the concerns are that we're not sure if the current infrastructure, such as water, wastewater, and utilities, would be able to support a project of increased density. And that also stating that um, the property owners have the right to look at properties that may affect their own property values. So this is one of the statements that the um, residents had had voted on. And then the next slide shows the adjacent property. So these are some some issues of concern adjacent to the properties that nobody wants a flood in their neighborhood. Um, next slide, please. This is what the if the if the applicant removes the overlay, they're asking for some really big changes. We don't know what their project is, but just by removing the overlay, you can see it's really substantial changes. Okay, next slide. So when the applicant bought the property, they made this pact that this is what they were going to abide by. No structure shall exceed 30 feet in height within 100 feet of a property used or zoned SF3 NCCD. And then the city also said, that any project that didn't fit with these requirements, they wouldn't grant any permits. So in the next slide, we can see that there's a house, a single family um, SF3 house on Melissa Lane, so that adding anything bigger than that, would they would not be abiding by their the covenants in the NCCD. Okay, next slide. So 
the, and then this is the last slide. So the, the, the neighborhood planning contact team had these concerns about alcohol sales and um, additional traffic and things like that. And they sent a letter April the 18th, 2019, and they haven't received a response yet. So the, the neighbors would really like to get a response to, to this, these questions and what the concerns are. And these are going to be much more important concerns than what they want to do with the property. More about how these, these things are going to affect the, the neighbors. So are there any questions? Okay, and that's it. Did they erase your hand? No, it's still raised. No, we we are getting. Yes, but okay, so Richard, I guess you can share your screen if you like. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And can you see the screen? Not yet. Okay. Um, okay. It says here there was a glitch, and we're not sorry. Um, for some reason, it kicked me out of. Uh, Microsoft Teams. So, uh, do you have the presentation? Yeah. Okay. Let me pull that up. If you don't mind? I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just say slide, and that'll make it go faster. Apologies. I was I had it set up, and it just uh, it just kicked me out. Okay. Let me go back to my screen sharing. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Well, hello, um, uh, and, uh, NCCD. I'm Richard Weiss, and I'm the architect and the uh, applicant for 200 Academy zoning and uh, for the zoning and flum application to be removed from the NCCD. The technical request is to ma maintain the base zoning that's always been on the property and to go from CS1, NCCD, NP, CS NCCD NP and MF4 NCCD NP to CS1 NP, CS NP and MF4 NP. Um, before we uh, dive into the, um, the, well, this first shot shows uh, the site in 1965. And as you can see, it's bifurcated. Uh, there's the MF4 along the residential side, CS along the commercial side, which extends to the same uh, edge as what is currently the commercial um, along the uh, western edge uh, or residential, multifamily residential along the western edge of the property. Um, and uh, this was uh, in 1965 where the majority of the property was a parking lot to serve uh, the um, Terrace Motor Court. Uh, so ne next slide. Uh, I'm gonna give a, a brief overview of the uh, rich history of the site. Um, in 1957, the Terrace Motor Court opened and uh, 200 Academy was part of that block that faces Congress Avenue. It was all one, one block and it served as parking for the motor court in the same configuration as the current parking lot. Uh, next slide. Oh, sorry. No, no keep this slide, please. Um, uh, in 1974, uh, um, the Texas Opera House opened on site. Uh, Cosmic Cowboy Doug Som played the opening of the venue, and later that year, Waylon Jennings recorded the number one country album, uh, Waylon Live There. In 1977, it was purchased by Willie Nelson and became the Austin Opry House and changed names to the Austin Opera House in 1979, which it remained the Austin Opera House until it closed in 1991. They hosted uh, thousands of shows from every genre there, 
um, and Arlen Studios opened there in 1984. And around that same time, Music Lane became a city street and uh, separated the properties. Um, and uh, the reason why it was named Music Lane was because the Opera House, the Soap Creek Saloon had relocated there from West, the Westlake neighborhood and the Austin Rehearsal Complex was there. So it made it a center for the music scene that would transform uh, Austin into what is now the live music capital of the world. Um, in 1986, Stevie Ray Vaughan recorded the double platinum live album, Live Alive, on the very stage that still sits uh, in that building. Um, and uh, also in 1986, the NCCD overlay was placed on the site and the site hasn't changed for the last 35 years. Um, next slide, please. So as, as the neighborhood showed in their presentation, the impacts of the NCCD on the site, on, I, I've uh, uh, bifurcated just like the site is divided in half. Everything to the left uh, refers to the Congress um, CS side and all of the information on the right refers to the, uh, to the residential side. So uh, for the CS and CS1, the floor area ratio goes from uh, two to one to 0.35. Um, 0.35 is uh, less than uh, all of your houses are in the NCCD. Uh, they're all 0.4 to one. And I believe it is possibly the lowest uh, um, FAR uh, assigned to commercial property uh, in the city. Um, uh, the height um, uh, went from uh, 60 feet to 35 feet. Uh, and uh, the building coverage uh, went from uh, 95 uh, percent to 65 percent, and uh, the major, uh, the biggest impact was that the use was uh, is now limited to um, office, uh, oh, Richard, sorry, light office and restricted residential. Uh, Richard, the, um, can the, you speak up a little bit? Someone's saying they're having some quality. You kind of, you kind of saw the the auto quality, audio volume is a little low. Okay, uh, I can speak up here. So uh, the um, uh, use is now limited to light office and uh, restricted residential on the commercial portion of the site. Uh, light office excludes uh, medical office and and uh, and the uh, residential unit cap on the commercial portion of the site is uh, 15 units per acre, whereas a CS uh, zoning uh, with the MU overlay would have uh, 34 to 54 units per acre. Uh, it also restricts live music, which is the historical um, uh, use of the site and certainly the use that that is most relevant to uh, Austin's history and culture, um, retail, museum, uh, restaurant, office, gallery, everything else is is uh, excluded from the site. On the MF4 portion of the site, and this is interesting, the, the, there is a significant cap to the number of units going from 34 to 54 units per acre on a typical MF4 site to 22 units per acre which is less than half of, of what, what could be allowed. Um, the impervious cover goes from 70% to 55%. But what I consider interesting is that the, uh, the massing and the FAR and the height actually remain the same. What was shown about SF6 and lower zoning uh, uh, doesn't apply to this site because MF4 is higher than SF6. So uh, this, this portion of the site uh, actually uh, conforms to what is uh, um, typical city of Austin compatibility. Uh, the, uh, because you can build the same uh, massing, uh, but less units, this uh, naturally leads to having to um, build larger units uh, in the same area and uh, which would make them more expensive, serve less needs, and uh, is the antithesis of uh, the smart growth uh, um, uh, comprehensive uh, ideas of the city, uh, in, especially in an area that's specifically targeted uh, for residential uh, uh, development. And um, as a result, this overlay on the base zoning of MF4 um, is essentially uh, zoning a parking lot historic to, to, to limit uh, development since there is no contributing, um, uh, no, nothing about this site contributes to the Fairview Park uh, NCCD history or uh, structure. Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the next slide is the current context. 
which um, you all are aware of on the um, commercial side, South Congress has developed uh, very uh, um, uh, robustly with the Muse apartments, which have been there for a long time, but go up to 60 feet in height. The music lane development, uh, which again uh, caps out at 60 feet in height. The Magdalena, which is in the NCCD, but um, was granted 85 feet in height uh, adjacent to uh, the CS1 and CS zoning of 200 Academy, which is capped at uh, 30, uh, 35 feet max. So there's a 50 foot difference between the two buildings that now uh, sit adjacent to one another. Um, and then there's the Hotel St. Cecilia, which was not originally in the NCCD. I believe it was incorporated into the NCCD. Um, but uh, as you can read, the St. Cecilia was created in honor of the patron state of music and poetry. And I'll let you read the rest. Uh, but it seems like it's uh, very consistent with, uh, with our goals for the site. And then across the street um, on Academy, there is uh, another uh, multifamily project. Uh, and then on the Melissa Lane site, um, there are four properties that face uh, the uh, MF4 portion of the site, uh, which is, uh, according to the code, MF4 is a, is a residential buffer zoning um, for, uh, to buffer for more intense uses. And uh, you know, 206 Bonneview is attached to the site on the north side, and that's also owned by the, the uh, same owner as 200 Academy. There are the, uh, the one lot on Bonneview, the two lots on Melissa Lane, um, one of which faces Grandview, uh, which have a continuous vegetative buffer on their side. And then 210 Academy, which I believe is, is a contributing structure to the NCCD. Um, it is a four-story uh, residence, including a basement and, and uh, occupiable attic, uh, as opposed to the two-story limit that the commercial uh, part of uh, the uh, 200 Academy has. And then again, to the remainder of the south area of the, of the uh, uh, neighborhood, there is no single family residential uh, to the uh, south or to the, to the west of the property along the um, academy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is just illustrate, you know, the, the, the text was the last slide. This slide is all of the graphic uh, representations of uh, uh, you know, photographs of what has occurred along Congress. Um, what has, uh, you know, you can see uh, the Muse is four stories. Uh, the uh, um, music lane development is, is three stories, but still 60 feet. Um, you can see the third image on the commercial side is 200 Academy. This is actually taken from the single family uh, residential um, at the corner of Academy uh, and Melissa, and uh, you know everything that's behind the 200 Academy building uh, uh, dwarfs 200 Academy, but it's still significantly set back from that property. And then um, on the residential side, you can see that there is a vegetative buffer along Melissa Lane. Uh, there are only two houses that actually front onto Melissa Lane. And uh, and then you can see this uh, the parking lot, which has remained unchanged since the earliest slides that I could find, which was 1965. And then finally, the house at the corner, corner of uh, I should say, the beautiful house at the corner of uh, Academy and Melissa, which is going through a um, modern or modern addition and a, a beautiful restoration of of the existing building. Um, uh, but but this leads me to uh, you know the question of compatibility, which which you brought up. Um, if you could please uh, um, show the next slide. So in 200 Academy, uh, I, I believe that the current zoning creates a compatibility compa uh, canyon. Again, the MF4 property would conform to um, the citywide Article 10 compatibility standards, and it's interesting because. Um, the uh, um, Article 10 was uh, uh, approved uh, by council in February of 1986, and then the NCCD came in uh, July, I believe, of, of 86, so it was about four or five months. So the compatibility, which works well throughout the city, 
between residential and um, and uh, larger developments between single family and larger developments and has become a standard tool um, uh, that had never been tested at the point of the uh, the uh, drafting of the ND NCCD so I could understand the concerns at that point but uh, 35 years later this has proven to be a very uh, effective tool but you can see because the CS zoning and CS1 is limited to 35 story uh, feet two stories and 0.35 FAR what happens is the MF4 rises to a certain point and then drops off uh, to to a, a, a two-story 35-foot limit, and then that is adjacent to the 60 to 85 feet um, that uh, occurs along Music Lane, um, and uh, that Music Lane border uh, that you see there uh, is also the border of the NCCD, so it's not uh, interior to the neighborhood, it's, it's on the edge of the neighborhood. You can also read for yourself the MF4 is a, uh, is designed to be uh, buffer residential. It is uh, designed for centrally located area near supporting transportation and commercial facilities, um, an area adjoining downtown. Uh, it is uh, the definition of 200 Academy. And then below, you can see that as far as the uh, single family goes, the MF4 uh, entitlements uh, in terms of compatibility don't change. The only thing that would change would be the CS1, which would be buffered both visually uh, and also audibly uh, um, and activity-wise uh, from the CS and CS1. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we received your letter. Thank you. And I would like to just read into the record. Uh, there were two points of concern in that letter. Uh, the first being alcohol sales, and it says alcohol sales bring inebriated people into our residential neighborhood. Neighbors along South Congress Corridor are experiencing increased trespassing by customers who urinate, defecate, engage in sex acts, use drugs, and or pass out. Adding an alcohol sales outlet interior to the neighborhood on a residential street will only worsen these problems. So the CS and CS1 is located along the northern border of the NCCD, not in the interior of the neighborhood, and is adjacent to compatible uses, including restaurants, office, and retail. Um, additionally, uh, there will be pedestrian linkages to uh, the music lane, um, uh, uh, both external and internal to the site, which will uh, drive uh, patrons uh, back to the robust commercial along uh, Congress as opposed to in into the neighborhood. Uh, the MF4 is adjacent to the four single family residences along Melissa Lane, which creates a residential buffer that will uh, limit access to the neighborhood interior. The second point was an influx of additional traffic in the already crowded part of the neighborhood. Your proposed restricted access and egress for automobiles entering and exiting on the site on Academy and Melissa would not address the majority of traffic, which is likely to be ride shares routed through the neighborhood by commercial wayfinder apps. Your site does not have access to South Congress and therefore is not a commercial corridor uh, where the use, uses you propose and uh, attendant traffic are appropriate. So we, we were able to get a TIA done on this site. Um, it is, uh, the city has it now and is doing their review, but the TIA proposes a traffic circle located on Academy prior to any single family uh, that will mitigate um, commercial and rideshare traffic into the neighborhood and drive it back to back down the 800 feet of Academy to Congress. Uh, additionally, there will be a rideshare lane uh, on the edge of our property uh, to accommodate drop-off points prior to uh, the MF4 portion of the neighborhood. And the traffic circle is also uh, prior to the MF4 portion of the neighborhood. And uh, there will be additional rideshare facilities uh, that will be located on uh, Music Lane, and um, and again, we will provide uh, pedestrian access and encourage them to uh, move in the direction of activity. And the TIA also shows minimal traffic impacts on Nooning, uh, which is 5%, LeGrand, Bonnie View, and Melissa Lane. Um, the only major impact in, in terms of the increase of traffic is the 800 feet on Academy, uh, which is uh, to the area that's west of 200 Academy, uh, where there's no single family, 
and everything along that corridor is, um, is either commercial or um, multifamily uh, residential, and most of it is, is new. And uh, the TIA also proposes for the site several uh, pedestrian and transit uh, improvements throughout the neighborhood that will make it uh, more walkable and more easily accessible to transit, including uh, on nooning a, uh, a cross to get uh, across Riverside. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the 200 Academy, this is, this is my uh, last slide. And again, uh, our bullet points are 200 Academy shouldn't be in the NCCD because the truly historic use of the site is the Austin Opera House is prohibited by the NCCD on Music Lane in the live music capital of the world. Uh, it's a waste of the base zoning potential that's been on the site since the site had zoning and uh, a waste of the potential to meet the housing's uh, cultural and housing goals along a, uh, a uh, two activity corridors, both Riverside and, um, and uh, South Congress uh, in an area that's adjacent to downtown. Um, it's on the edge of the NCCD and not a contributing structure or site to the NCCD. Um, uh, regarding infrastructure, it is actually an opportunity to improve drainage and failing infrastructure. We do have an easement that runs right through our site for wastewater, storm, storm, stormwater improvements. And we've already reached out to the city to start talking about how we can uh, uh, improve those facilities, uh, not only for our site, but for uh, the neighborhood as a whole. Um, the adjacent uh, development on uh, Music Lane and Congress eclipses uh, the two-story uh, existing structure on uh, 200 Academy, which if you take the commercial portion of the site, uh, that site is, is maxed out. You can't build anything else on the commercial portion because of that point. 3.5 to 1 FAR uh, limitation. Um, the overlay on the MF4 creates a historically zoned parking lot. Um, the uh, ideal, this is an ideal location for pedestrian and transit access to downtown and amenities. Uh, it's one of the rare opportunities to add additional housing uh, in the neighborhood that again, the compatibility would remain the same on the MF4 side and it wouldn't displace a single resident. Uh, it is, uh, I believe, to be the most underutilized property in the Fairview Park, uh, Travis Heights neighborhood, uh, because it hasn't changed uh, in over 35 years and has uh, an amazing amount of potential. Uh, there are additional protections that were not in place when the Opera House was originally opened. Uh, again, Article 10 compatibility uh, had only been in place for five months. And then section two, uh, or nine dash two, the noise and amplified sound ordinance, which is um, noise and amplified sound uh, adjacent uh, to uh, other properties uh, was instituted in 1992, which was the year after the opera house closed. Uh, and then finally, um, the uh, new uh, proposed code, which uh, is, is paused currently, um, has proposed ways to accommodate density within the NCCD, and their proposal included upzoning uh, a number of the single family properties in the NCCD to um, allow more density on the lots that are actually contributing to the fabric of the neighborhood. So I think there's an opportunity for us to work together to provide uh, density in the neighborhood that's, that's greatly needed without uh, changing the existing uh, residential fabric. And then uh, finally, I just want to say that um, I recognize and, and Chris and I and, and our team recognize that, that you feel as strongly about keeping this land and, and the NCCD and keeping the uses limited as we do about bringing back the Opera House and allowing this property to uh, realize its, its base zoning potential and potential to both the culture and housing needs of the city. Um, so I would ask that as you speak to your concerns, uh, I, I would welcome any suggestions and dialogue of how you believe we can come to terms that would allow the Opera House to reopen and allow for what we consider to be appropriate density on 200 Academy. Thank you. 
So with the conclusion of the presentations, uh, we'll start, we'll go into the question and answer uh, thing, but uh, portion, but uh, there was a, several questions while the presentations were going on. And uh, one of them uh, from a Colin Corgan said that, uh, it's more of a statement than a question, said that there is a single family house on ravine that uh, I'm not that familiar with this area, so I just wanted to bring that up. Uh, another question from Eloa Matthews uh, asked, when was the TI submitted to the city and why was it not submitted to the contact team in advance of this meeting? I, I can't speak to the when it was submitted, but Richard, um, it was originally submitted to the city, I want to say, in, I don't have it in front of me, but I would guess uh, in around October, and then they, uh, they were, and then they had the scoping requirements, and I believe that the, the uh, final uh, TIA was submitted um, uh, the last week of November. These are rough dates, but, but around That's those fine. times. And Maureen, you respond to the second part of that? Uh, I can't see the question. Hold on. Well, it was, uh, why wasn't it submitted given to the neighborhood uh, prior to this meeting? I, I, well, no, that's really, we can't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, yeah, um, I've, I've never had, <laughs> I mean, like I said in my email uh, to the question about the TIA, the plan amendment meeting is primarily to discuss the plan amendment case. Um, zoning questions are asked. Um, we don't normally send out TIAs. It's gone through the review process with the transportation reviewer. Um, I guess you could have asked for it from Kate. Uh, I think you did ask for it. I thought she had sent it to you. But anyway, it would have been something that you would have requested from Kate, the zoning planner. Okay, and uh, there's several people have their hands up. <clears throat> and if I mispronounce your name, I apologize in advance. Uh, someone, Suzanne Schuwerk has had her hand up for some time. Uh, do you have a question? Need to unmute yourself. We've had a significant problem with parking in the neighborhood during the construction and development of the sites on Congress and um, some destruction of trees from the construction traffic. I, I feel like the presentation hasn't taken into consideration um, the impact that, that it will have on these streets that were never designed for this kind of density. Also, my home has a grinder pump because the um, sewer system does not, was never completed. Uh, I feel like the capacity in this area is um, insufficient. And I would like to know if something is gonna be done about that the development of this property. Uh, I'll respond to that. Um, yes, uh, we, I mean, we went through a, a complete TIA exercise to uh, determine um, the, uh, how uh, all of the adjacent streets would be impacted by the development. And uh, uh, you can see through the TIA that um, uh, there are not uh, any dramatic increases other than than that one section of Academy. But right now you can park on both sides of Academy and that would change when you do the uh, traffic circle. And it would also, uh, you know, we would be providing all of the parking uh, for our site that would be required per code. The uh, and then as far as infrastructure goes, uh, yes, we would, uh, I imagine that we would have to do significant uh, water, wastewater, uh, electrical, uh, all utility improvements uh, 
for a development um, on 200 Academy because we already know that the storm sewer uh, easement uh, is is going to need to be addressed and uh, the rest of the utilities will need to be upgraded as well. You're going to have a lot of people coming through to this site from other streets other than Congress, even if you put that traffic circle in there, because we've seen this happen with the construction that's ongoing right now. Um, unfortunately, our um, WGI was not available tonight to make this meeting, but uh, as I said, we do have a TIA uh, that addresses um, all of the adjacent streets, and so uh, um, that, that study is, uh, is available. Before we go into the next person with their hand up, uh, someone, uh, John David Swan, is asking or stating this is a this is not a meeting of the neighborhood plan contact team. No, this meeting is required by code, and it goes out to everybody who owns property or lives or is a representative or organization. That is within 500 whose boundaries is within 500 feet of the of the property in question uh it's an opportunity for uh people and surrounding the subject track to ask questions of the applicant and so, um uh, i did see another question from uh paula uh paula i appreciate your question and uh yes uh the the tia was submitted during the pandemic but um uh, most of the information that was used, um, most of the information uh, was taken from uh, data that was collected. I'm sorry, if you're not speaking, can you please mute? Yes. Um, it was uh, it was taken uh, during uh, pre-pandemic or uh, during the. Uh, uh, the, the construction of of other uh, of some of the other projects. Okay. The next question is from Terry Franz. Uh, if you would please unmute and ask your question, please. It's Terry Franz. Franz. Uh, and two questions. One, I just want to make sure that Richard Weiss's presentation is going to be um, available. Is that is it? Yes, all the presentations will be available on our, on the Speak Up Austin. Web page. Once we put the we put the video up, and that usually goes up three to four days after the meeting, and we'll put everything up. <clears throat> It'll all be available on the website. Okay. And then second question is um, is a request for the TIA. So either with the <clears throat> materials from this meeting or um, or to the the people present at the meeting by email or I don't care how, but we would like a copy of the TIA. Um, I can contact Kate, the zoning planner tomorrow and uh, see how that can be done. OK, thank you. Thank you, Terry. And the next uh, person with their hand up is Laura Toops. Laura, did I get your name right? <laughs> yes, Mark, you did. Okay. Um, so, um, so my question, of course, you don't have your traffic engineer, but, you know, I live at the intersection of LaGrande and Nooning, and there was a traffic counter that was put up sometime this summer. Um, so I just want to point out, and I have already emailed the staff reviewing the TIA with a number of questions, is Academy Drive has been closed for over two years. So the, the big thing is the cut through traffic. And, and I had discussions with you, Richard, previously on this. I, you know, traffic circle may mitigate some things, but the cut through to Riverside that is down Hillside, down LaGrande, and then Nooning, um, I will be hard pressed to see how the data that your TIA, what they use for background traffic right now, because not only was that traffic counter, and I, maybe it wasn't you guys, but nobody else in our neighborhood is doing a zoning change, was put up during a pandemic, there's no school, and Academy Drive was closed at South 
Congress. So um, this will be a major issue for us. And, and I would also address um, that, you know, when that track was one large track and it fronted South Congress, that was something different. So the fact that you feel a canyon is being made between the increased density along a major corridor, South Congress, which we get, but to have access over uh, only to a neighborhood uh, collector uh, in academy is for this density is, is inappropriate in my mind. I would also point out that Code Next did not remove the NCCD on this property. So I think we still remain um, in disagreement about appropriate use as you come towards single family. Uh, I would also argue MF4 would not pro probably, be, probably be the typical land use right next to single family. It might be MF2, uh, MF3, but the track currently allows uses um, that, although some of us would prefer those densities weren't even there, I think it was a reasonable compromise at the time that the NCC uh, uh, D was done back in the 80s, as this neighborhood was pretty foresighted um, in looking ahead at land uses as you come into the interior of our neighborhood. And uh, this is in the interior with the access just off of Academy. So uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, the TIA. I was told that the reviewer hasn't gotten into the review yet, um, but um, we will, we will, you know, anxiously want to look at that and participate in discussions with you and your, your engineers on that. So thanks. Before we go to the next person with their hand up, uh, there was a question in the chat box from Colin Corgan. Uh, is this, can the neighborhood sponsor and submit another TIA report? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. We would have to write that one down and get back uh, to you all. I, I just don't know. That's not something I, I just have personal knowledge of. Maureen, do you have any insight? Uh, no. I've, I haven't seen that done before, but um, since I'm not a zoning planner, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, um, but I can talk to Kate tomorrow. Okay, we I, can do that and get back to you on that. And I would just like to state after 36 years of, of doing civil engineering support in the city on projects, uh, the neighborhood can get our own traffic engineers to, to look at the TIA, the applicant submits their own TIA with their zoning. So, uh, but nothing precludes us from looking at it and arguing the, the technical basis. Okay. Oh, I thought your question was that, can the neighborhood submit their own TIA report? That that was the question, but I'm just clarifying for okay. Colin that, um, you know, when a zoning case is submitted, the applicant submits their TIA, but nothing stops the neighborhood from a technical discussion uh, with our own consultants. Right, and that's, yeah, that I was answering his question. So um, Colin, do you want me to follow up on your specific question or is uh, Laura's question answer enough for you? Okay. Answer enough. That's fine. Okay, okay. Um, next person is, Eloa Matthews, if you'd unmute and ask your question, please. Um, thank you. I wasn't asking why the city didn't submit the TIA to the contact team. I was asking why the applicant didn't share the TIA results with the contact team if they've had those results since October and um, you know, in advance of this meeting so that we could be as prepared as they are. Um, you're asking us to, you're asking the contact team to amend the future land use map of which we are the stewards. And you're asking us to give you something that is going to benefit you financially. You need to give us the information that we need 
to understand what you're asking for. So that is on the applicant. That is not, I'm not suggesting that the city should have done that. So I was wondering why the applicant did not provide that to us. Um, also, I was trying, I'm grateful that uh, Colin put in the notes that the Reed Purcell house, the Red Purcell house was built in 1851. And I'm wondering why that doesn't establish that as residential. The Terrace Motel came in the late 50s or the 60s. So that's not, the, the, the precedent is residential, it's not commercial. And and I don't I you know I'm asking the applicant why they didn't submit the TIA. I'm directly asking them that in this meeting. And why can't they do that now? We don't need Maureen to do that. Uh, we uh, well, first of all, we you know we got the scoping uh, requirements uh, from from the city, and we went through a lot of back and forth about what they were looking for. We got it completed. Um, this has been our first contact uh, with the neighborhood um, uh, since we submitted the zoning application, which was December, uh, actually one month ago today, um, and uh, and we, we can provide you the TIA. Great. That would be great. Could you send it to Laura on our behalf, please? And the other question I have is... Um, I will, I would like to... Uh, say that we have not gotten back comments from the city yet. And so we would like to review the city comments before we distribute it. Um, but I don't know when those are coming. Um, I, I'm gonna leave that to Laura to respond to that because I'm, I just, I'm saying this is not on the city. If you're appealing to the, contact team to do something, we have to have the information before we can do that. Understood. Um, secondly, the notice for filing of application for rezoning states specifically that the, um, the proposed zoning change to CS1 MU neighborhood plan states that it is intended predominantly for commercial and industrial activities of a service nature, which typically have operating characteristics or traffic service requirements, generally incompatible with residential environment. So knowing that the, the zoning change you're asking for is incompatible with what is pre-existing there, why would you ask for that? Uh, you're, 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 Richard, you're, you're muted. Um, can you, can you, uh, can you share your screen and what you're talking about? Because that was not part of our request. Uh, what we asked was just, you know, the, uh, we, we asked to maintain the base zoning that has always been on the site and to remove the overlay. Uh, as you know, the site is bifurcated. And as far as single family residential uses, the MF4 is the buffer between single family residential uses and the CS uh, zoning, which is consistent with the rest of the CS zoning along the line of, um, you know, meaning the same distance from the edge of, of Congress. But as to the rest of what you said, I wasn't following. Okay, so it's in the notice of filing of application for rezoning under the proposed zoning change from it says what it is and then under two cs1 mu neighborhood plan and it describes what that district the cs1 mu neighborhood plan uh is designed to be for commercial and industrial activities that are generally incompatible with residential environment if i remember uh, that that's, yeah, that, that's just a general description of. Oh, go, go ahead, Mark. You can answer. The, the, yeah, that that's the purpose statement from the CS zoning district, uh, which which is right from the code. I mean, that's I'm just, mm. that's where that came from. Uh, I'm sure that if you had an MF4, it would have the it would probably have the. 
purpose statement of that as well. Yes. Richard. Okay, well, yeah, as far as the purpose statement goes, again, uh, that was the, uh, the base zoning that has always been on the site, which allowed for the use, which I believe contributes historically uh, and culturally uh, to the city of Austin as a whole. I think that, again, uh, you know, this is, this is what we're asking for. I would welcome any suggestions as to how we can accomplish our goals and your goals at the same time. But, uh, you know, our uh, main impetus was to remove an overlay that's overly restrictive and doesn't uh, allow the city to realize what Austin has become in uh, 2021 as opposed to 1986. Well, I think I think you're when you came to us, Richard, actually in 2019 and made that recommendation, that was one thing. But now the pandemic has got, you know, has changed sort of what's happening in Austin. The the music industry, many of the venues are having to rely on, um, you know, federal tax dollars and funding from the city to remain open or to even keep their employees on the payroll. So um, it, it's a different time. I'm, I don't want to go, you know, go down that road too far, but the Reed, the Red Purcell house being there since the, the 1800s pretty much establishes that that is a residential area and it is interior to the neighborhood. I know it might not be in your mind, but in our mind, it is. Uh, I, in my mind, and and the fact that it is on on the border of the NCCD, it, it touches the edge of the NCCD. And the Reaper Cell House, that's the the house on the corner of um, uh, Melissa and Academy, correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it's a beautiful house, and it is a, a contributing structure. But I think that there is a uh, a very firm distinction between. Um, Academy uh, Drive uh, uh, north, or sorry, east of, of uh, Melissa Lane and west of Melissa Lane. Yes, there is a single family residence on Ravine, at, you know, on the interior of Ravine, but the corner of Ravine and Academy Drive is a multifamily project. That's an interesting opinion. <laughs> I don't have anything else to say about that. I just, I, I want to make sure we get the TIA. I wanted us to make sure we're on the record that we sent you the letter in April 2019 and we hadn't heard, you know, back from you. So we need that information. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. The next question with their hand raised. Here's uh, um, Suzanne. Shuwerk, if you'd unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, this is our husband, Bob Shuwerk. Oh. I'm trying to get a sense of uh, the schedule moving forward. Uh, after we've had this meeting and we've had an opportunity to respond, um, now that we have a fuller picture of what is intended, uh, what steps do we need to take and in what time frame? That's one set of questions. And the other question is just a personal information question, Richard. What is the current proposed uh, size of the of the entertainment venue, the capacity of it? The, so um, what we're currently proposing uh, would be uh, less than uh, 10,000 square feet. And so that would uh, differ uh, depending on, on whether it's um, uh, seated or standing. Um, but uh, it, you know, the original Austin Opera House uh, was uh, 16,000 square feet, and then there was an 8,000 square foot secondary uh, venue. Um, you know, we want to honor the Opera House and, and bring music back to Music Lane. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would, again, welcome any working group to to uh, discuss these issues in greater detail and uh, and see if we can come to some kind of consensus. And the scheduling uh, part of my question, I think it's probably uh, for others. 
Yeah, I can go ahead and um, address it. This is Maureen, the case manager for the plan amendment case. So what will happen is we cannot schedule the case for planning commission and city council until the re final review of the TIA. Um, I talked to Kate Clark about that uh, today. So once the TIA review is complete, uh, we will start scheduling it for planning commission city council. We don't have any dates set for that. As soon as we start looking at prospective dates, I'll work with the planning contact team um, on getting a, you know, either updated recommendation or, you know, if they want me to keep the current recommendation, but whatever we they submit, we will add it to the case report. But at this time, um, it has not been scheduled. We're waiting for the final TIA um, to be final. The TIA the TIA review to be finalized. OK, uh, we have another question from Hoff, uh, Paula Kaufman. If you'd lower your hand and please ask your question. Or yeah. Hi, um, yes, um, I feel like we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. There's still an NCC there's D in place. And I've read through the document. I don't see how you can take yourself out of it. So um, do you have plans of building some housing in the density that's prescribed by the NCCD, and which of course would, would preclude the music, but do you have another plan that actually would meet the terms of the commitment when you bought the property. Because the city signs this NCCD and according to the document I read, it said it said it can't provide a parking. I mean, it can't provide a permit for something that doesn't meet those requirements of the NCCD. Yes, what you're saying is correct. What we're proposing is being removed from the NCCD so that we can um, develop the property to MF4 uh, standards along uh, Melissa Lane. Um, uh, if we uh, um, if we can't come to terms with that, then we will uh, look at alternates. That, that fit more with, with what you have, because that's why the residents had the petition that if one if one um, one uh, property got out of the NCCD and they didn't have to abide by the terms and others could. And so when people bought, bought their properties, they bought the property with this NCCD in place. And so it looks like there's just some legal requirements to actually get out of it. And I don't see how the city can go around what's there. It's like if, if I bought a house in an HOA, I couldn't just extricate myself from the HOA. And if you have residents that are living in your apartment complexes and one resident says, well, I just don't want to abide by the rules. I want to have a music venue in my apartment complex. Then the other residents are going to have an issue with it. So a lot of these things that are being proposed would have a very significant impact on the people living in the area. A, a concert hall, a, a parking, um, where your where your wait staff is going to park, things like that. These are all very significant quality of life issues. That if you go back to the NCCD, it does provide for reasonable use of the property. I don't know why you have you have a parking lot there, but you could have some wonderful homes there too that meet the requirements that you have that are in place and so there are reasonable uses for it and these residents have put up with so much so much um construction thank you paula i i hear your concerns and uh you know um i i am an urbanist and i see this uh site a for its its history and B for its potential uh, based on the on the base zoning, uh, which again was in place before the NCCD. The overlay was put onto the property, and um, just like the city was proposing in the code next, the last version of the rewrite to take 
houses out of the NCCD, including all of the houses on Melissa Lane and uh, several houses on Bonnie View to take those out of the NCCD to allow for more density. Uh, they did not take uh, 200 Academy out of the NCCD because when the process stopped, it stopped at a point where only staff had made their recommendations and staff was given. And Mark, if you can, if you know any more about this, I would appreciate your input. But it was my understanding that staff was given a very narrow purview of what they could take out of the NCCD in the uh, buffer zones between corridors and neighborhoods and uh, commercial property was not in in that purview or not 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 just in the NCCD, but on any corridor. It was only residential properties that could be um, what they called up zone. In our case, we're not asking for an up zoning. We're asking for the removal of an overlay. Um, but but, uh, uh, you know, j just as we're asking for that removal um, on 200 Academy, the city was recommending it for. And if if you have my slide or when you receive it, you can see on the very last slide was recommending that for uh, most of the uh, residential properties, both along the riverside and the um, uh, Congress corridor. I am firmly against that. I think that the fabric of the interior of the neighborhood should remain uh, single family as, it, as it's always been. Uh, but I believe that you could accommodate the density that would have been achieved uh, by re, re uh, uh, developing the interior of the neighborhood on the MF4 and, C and MU portions of this site, and it would be a way to uh, uh, accommodate the density that's needed in Travis Heights, and uh, not uh, and show the city that by accommodating it on on the uh, 200 Academy site that you're relieving the pressure of rezoning uh, properties within the NCCD uh, uh, interior and um, and uh, um, hopefully be able to keep that fabric. Okay. <clears throat> there was uh, some questions in the chat, and I don't know if everybody was looking at it with regards to uh, will the PC and council be scheduled before the TI is reviewed by the neighborhood plan and contact team? I, I would probably say not because it takes several it takes a while to get something scheduled for PC and council, so uh, there should be time. And everyone, Marine can work with the with everybody to make sure the scheduling's done. Okay, moving through here. Uh, there's a question from from Colin Corgan. Do you think the overlay zoning makes sense in the light of Academy no longer being a through street? It's a dead end at Riverside. At the time of the base zoning, it was a through street. I, so. I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Do <clears throat> um, you think the overlay zoning makes sense in light of the of Academy no longer being a through street? It basically dead ends at Riverside. At the time of the base zoning, uh, it was, however, a through street. Meaning that it dead ended. It's. I mean, it still connects to Congress and Riverside. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I guess my my uh, uh, response to that would be, uh, and again, I think a lot of this discussion is going to bear on the uh, on the TIA. So I would say uh, it would be probably worthwhile um, for you to have the TIA and review it, and and hopefully for us to be able to. Uh, Put together a, a group that's interested where we can review it together and talk about uh, concerns and mitigations. Uh, but you know, when we did the TIA, it, it bore out that the that the traffic circle would would in fact limit uh, the uh, uh, through traffic going through to Academy because um, a all of the services that somebody would want to get to are. Uh, 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 literally on the other side of, of uh, 200 Academy, and uh, two, uh, it's it's the belief that that um, uh, the MF4 property uh, won't generate uh, a, sign a a tremendous amount of additional traffic in the neighborhood because uh, living this close to uh, commercial 
entertainment uh, services, restaurants, and downtown, uh, you don't need a car. You just need a scooter or legs. Okay. Uh, there's one question. Person with their hand up. It's Laura Tubes. Laura, would you unmute and ask your question, please? Sure, just a, a couple of statements and Richard alluded to being an urbanist and as the past president of the Congress for New Urbanism Central Texas chapter, I consider myself to be one as well. Um, but the, the densities that Code Next proposed within the neighborhood were, and the, you know, not everyone was in agreement with it, but it was, it was four to six units on tracks. Again, the question of compatible zoning as you get closer into the single family, uh, I'm gonna disagree with, with arguments you've made. Um, and then, you know, yeah, people living here a lot, that's great. Our concern is your commercial users. It's the drunk that come out of the bar that are gonna cut through to get to Riverside to go on I-35. So again, it's, it, we'll look to see the TIA, but that's 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 the big concern. If you had access to Congress Avenue, direct ac access and didn't have to access Academy, we probably wouldn't be having the same conversations. So it's, it's about how interior you are to the neighborhood, how cut off you are from Congress Avenue, and, and you're more part of the neighborhood than you are that dense commercial part of of Congress, so I just, that's just a statement, so. Uh, there was a thank, question. Thank you, Laura. Um, I do want to, uh, well, first of all, thank you for your statement. Um, and uh, and yes, I, I would welcome the opportunity uh, to, to uh, review other sites uh, of similar scales with similar um, access, uh, not to, uh, um, corridors, but to um, collector streets uh, adjacent to corridors uh, that have had successful, um, that are successful developments uh, with you. Thank you. Well, we're, we're running up towards the bottom of the hour and uh, it's 7.30. So we can try to go through with some of these uh, chat questions. Uh, <clears throat> one, someone, Paula Coffin made a statement. It says, it's a legal document with no expiration date. I assume she is referring to the NCCD. Uh, I was trying to clarify that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is a. It is what it is until council takes action to amend it, one way or another. It will stay that way. Uh, who has authority to release you from your compatibility standards? Again, that's from Paula Kaufman. Uh, that you could go to the Board of Adjustment, I think, would be the most, is usually the route of getting a compatibility waiver. Though, in all honesty, our code is fairly complex and detailed. There may be other pathways, but I would imagine it's probably the Board of Adjustment. I'm talking uh, about the compatibility standards that are laid out in the NCCD. It would still be the Board of Adjustment. Because it is a zoning. It is zoning. NCC is just a certain special flavor of zoning but at the end of the day it's a zoning overlay uh that uh allows you to do certain things with the in the in the crafting of the ordinance thank you <clears throat> uh aloha matthews has a question do you know what the drainage area for the site is is that i assume that's the uh the square footage or the acreage of the site Richard, do you know how big it is? It's approximately 4.6 acres. Okay. And uh, it's uh, right now, uh, um, I believe that our impervious cover would remain uh, pretty much the same as it is now uh, when we redo the site. You know, one of our proposals for the site is to take uh, the the MF4 along, um, <laughs> along Melissa Lane and, and do... Uh, residential and again in terms of compatibility the only thing that would change from the nccd uh um, compatibility standards uh the, the the outside of the building could look exactly the same the uh the uh the where you would have the impact is in is in the number of units so you could do 
more units or you know in the same area do uh, less but larger units, which uh, goes against most of the city's goals for uh, providing ho housing and uh, along activity centers. Um, uh, what was the other? Uh, oh, uh, yeah. So, so we would hope to keep impervious cover the same, and um, and uh, and then where the uh, parking lot is on the CS side, you know, there's a circle park that's to the uh, south of us, and then um, uh, there's the trail um, to the north of us, um, and and the creek, and you know, one of our goals for the project would be to uh, take the that portion in the center of the parking lot where the utility easement is and rework the uh, storm storm sewer, sewer easement to create uh, uh, green space throughout the project. Um, there's someone on the phone <clears throat> uh, who really can't raise their hand. Their, their phone number ends with 6327. Do you have any questions before we run out of time for the meeting? I guess. Hello? Yes. Oh, um, I didn't know I was unmuted. Um, uh, this is Cameron Rice, and um, I live on Hillside. And um, uh, thank you, Laura Tukes, uh, for your statement there. And um, Richard, it was nice that you uh, included the green space. That would pretty much be the only thing that I would say. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you guys are talking about that I really don't understand. But um, one thing would be from being here for 30 years would be to honor the fact that that creek is there and um, that so much does connect down to um, the trail, Town Lake, and, and really that being such a network for this area that's important as well. So um, regardless of what you do, um, you know, with talking about footwork and things like that, um, I think that the green space um, is, is a good thing to hear. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, no more questions. We're about three minutes till uh, end of time. Maureen, do you want to put up your contact information while, while you're doing that? Uh, something to say that this slide is incorrect. This is from Colin Corgan. This slide is incorrect on at least one front. Richard, do you agree there is a single family home west of Melissa? It's 1211 Ravine. If you argue it is not on a canopy, then do you also, do you agree you aren't also? Uh, I do agree that that uh, and and I, it is outside of the yes. There is a single family residence on Ravine across from from the park. It's not on the academy portion of Ravine, but yes, there is a single single family residence. But uh, where that is located, if you could put the map back up, uh, would still be. Um, uh, let me verify that. Yes, so so yes, there is a single single family resident past the multifamily on Ravine. I agree with that statement. So Marine, you want to put up your contact information? Yeah, and... I'm trying to okay. pull that up. Okay. And, and oh, uh, neighborhood, you have my contact information uh, as well. So please, uh, I, I would appreciate it if you, uh, if there's a group that would like to uh, get together and discuss any of these points further, I would, I would uh, be happy to talk to you. Okay. Well, if you're having some technical, there you go, Maureen. Just advance to the end, and there you go. There's the contact information. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, so nothing will be moving forward until after the TIA gets uh, re since it's that finishes its review. And looks like there's going to be some conversations between the applicant and the community. So, um, Marine, you want to kind of go re go re go over uh, what the next steps are? Yeah. So. Um... Once the the cases are ready to move forward, I can reach out to the planning contact team to let y'all know what prospective dates we're looking at. We could start working on um, your recommendation or any recommendation from surrounding property owners. 
um, members of the planning contact team, whatever comments you would like added to the staff case reports to go before planning commission and city council, we can work with you on uh, when the deadline would be for us to receive those to put it in the uh, case, staff case reports. Um, again, if you live within 500 feet, you'll get the notice in the mail. If you want to speak, um, you have to register in advance for planning commission. Um, uh, we get that information the Friday before the Tuesday planning commission date. I will send out an email with the information on how to register to speak. So I would say once we have uh, finalized the planning commission date, um, I'll be sending out that email the Friday before. Let's see. Any any questions that y'all might have on the process at this point that I didn't cover? Yes. Uh, yeah, Marie, Terry, Franz. Terry Franz has a question. Uh, it's going to recognize her. Please ask oh, your question. Sorry. I jumped again. Um, what exactly is moving forward? Um, and I apologize if this is an ignorant question, but um, I guess there's three requests when they want to be removed from the NCCD um, to the neighborhood plan amendment and through the zoning. So when you say moving forward, what moves forward and when is in other words, is the neighborhood plan amendment? Is that the same as the request to exit the NCCD? So the plan amendment application is a request to change the future land use map from mixed use office to um, yeah mixed use office to mixed use so that's the plan amendment application the zoning application is the application to be removed from the nccd so that's the second application and those two applications would move forward together and when they do what is the impact on the nccd assuming that that everything is granted that they're requesting, then what is the impact on the NCCD? The property at 200 Academy would no longer, if council was to vote in the affirmative to remove the, to, to grant the applicant's request, the NCCD would no longer contain 200 Academy. They have those four some odd acres. So that, that would be the, the net effect. Okay, so that's, what, that's what I was asking then. The neighborhood plan amendment includes the request to exit the NCCD. Is that correct? No. Um, according to Article 10, subchapter 6 of the city charter, says that all land use decisions have to be in alignment with the comprehensive plan. The uh, South Central, the, the neighborhood plan is, is, is a part of the comprehensive plan. So in order to get a zoning change that's contrary to what your plan's future land use map says, you have to get a plan amendment for a land use that would allow that the requested zoning. Uh, so that's what the neighborhood plan amendment is doing. And then the zone request is to uh, just, you know, ch change, uh, remove the property from the NCCD. And uh, that's pretty much it. Correct, Richard? You're on mute. Yes, yes. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Well, Maureen, do you want to ask me, re, re ask that question? You said uh, anything about process? Yeah, were there any other, any questions about the process? Did anything I leave out um, in my response to the, the next steps that people need clarification? I have a question. Sure. Um, in our neighborhood plan, it says that the contact team is the advocate or I'm looking it up. I, I need to find the exact word for the NCCD. Is that um, since the neighborhood plan is uh, the adopted amendment to imagine Austin, does that mean that the Neighborhood plan contact team is responsible for voting on the recommendation of whether to remove the NCCD or not. No, that would be a separate act. Really, that would be uh, a zoning question. This is more of just a land use question uh, in regards in, 
in the context of being an amendment to an element of the comprehensive plan, which is the neighborhood plan. Okay, so uh, on page 43 of our neighborhood plan recommendation A6, and I'm assuming this is the adopted plan, it's in the book given to us by the city of Austin, it says, continue to regularly monitor and amend the Fairview Park Neighborhood Conservation Con uh, Combining District in CCD and appropriate land use changes. So you see that under the purview as of zoning, not well, under the plum amendment. It could be both. Okay. It just depends what the request, the zoning request is. Because you can ask, say you, you're commercial land use and you can go from the lowest commercial district to the highest commercial district you wouldn't need a plan amendment, but you would just need a zone change. But if you're going from, say, commercial to multifamily or commercial to to single family, then you would require both a, a plan amendment and a zoning change. Okay. I may have further questions on that. Thank you. Uh huh. So, there's no more questions. We can convene the meeting. Okay. Thank, thank you. you so, well, thank you, Maureen. You had something to say? No, I was just going to say um, I will work with um, another staff member to get this recorded meeting up to the Speak Up Austin website as soon as we can. Um, and um, you can just keep either checking the website or you can email me to see if it's up. But anyway, that will be the next thing I do. I will work with Kate um, as far as uh, if, if there were zoning questions that y'all asked tonight, I can follow up with her. But again, there's my contact information. If you wanted to shoot me an email tomorrow, um, anything that didn't get answered tonight, just let me know and we'll work with getting you those answers. Okay, and before we, everyone goes, someone asked if the slides will be on the website and uh, yes, they will be, uh, so they'll be up. Also, the video might be edited a little bit for for content. So there's an early part where we're kind of trying to get everything working. We might just cut that out for watchability purposes, but nothing substantive would be removed from the uh, present from the video. So, Thank you. Mm -hmm. So everyone have a good evening and I think it's about time for dinner. So uh, mm. have a, everyone have a pleasant evening. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Thanks.